We can often sin in small ways and look the other way, white lies, laziness, bad habits. But like a vine, these sins can start small, and before you know it, they can cover the entire wall. So what happens when these small transgressions turn into a lifetime of running from the consequences? Let's get into it. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Yes, and that includes sound effects. We do this by using true life stories of real people. Just a heads up, the story in this week's episode contains some scenes that well, might not be appropriate for younger viewers, so parental supervision is advised. I'm Timothy Gregory, and I've got a question for you. Does your sin control you? Sin is a slippery slope, and it can often start small, grow, and end up hurting you and others in your life. Now, many times it isn't realized as a problem until, well, it seems you're too far gone. So how do you tell when you start to slide? How can you tell if sinful desires are the ones calling the shots in your life? That's what we'll be looking at in this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. We've all dug ourselves into a hole before. Sometimes it's something small, like ditching plans with a friend because you were sick, only to run into them at the grocery store. (laughs) Or in other cases, it's something that can be life-altering, like picking up a bad habit that slowly turns into an addiction. Sometimes we even dig ourselves into a spiritual hole, We can convince ourselves that we've sinned too many times and we're in too deep to ever change. Yet down in that hole, the question always lies, is there a way out? Which is exactly what the man in this week's episode needed to find out. Also, you want to stick around because later we are going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter our sweepstakes drawing for a prize. No, it's not a cash prize, but it is a prize. And I think it's a prize that you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. The classic true story of Harold Sullivan, part one. What'll it be, George? Mm, Just a bottle of beer. Trying to give my ulcer a rest. (laughs) Don't blame the booze. You know what gives you ulcers? Yeah, yeah. You're a worry wart. Look who's talking. I don't worry. I give ulcers. I don't get them. (laughs) (laughs) You sure about that? What's that supposed to mean? You're worried about something, Sully. I know. I've been watching you. What's there to worry about? I don't know, but you are. If I didn't know you for a guy with guts, I'd say you're scared. Scared? What, are you a psychic? No, but I think I know you as good as anybody. What's got you worried, Sully? All right. We've been pretty good friends, George. You heard anything about a takeover in this part of the state? Mm, you mean by the mob? That's one name for them. Mm, I heard something. I can name you half a dozen bar owners I know personally. Guys who've taken on what you might call silent partners. And you know about it. And all in the last two or three weeks. Yeah. They're leaning on you? Trying. What'd you say? I told them to get lost. Think you're tough enough to make it stick? Maybe. That was a week ago. I haven't heard from them since. You will, Sully. They'll make their move. They always do. What was that? Something came through the window. Hit the floor! (laughs) The bomb thrown through the tavern window put the proprietor and several customers in the hospital. It also convinced the proprietor to move his business elsewhere. So he sold out moved to an unfamiliar city, and bought what he thought was a small neighborhood bar. But the move lifted him out of the frying pan and dropped him right into the fire. What happened next makes for one of the strangest stories we have ever told. You'll hear it all as we bring you part one of the classic true story of Harold Sullivan, right now on Unshackled. I was born in Harrisburg, Illinois, in the hilly coal country that people call Little Egypt. 
My dad was a miner, but in the early 1930s after Prohibition, he opened the first tavern in that part of the country. During the first days of the new business, I stood on an empty soft drink case and drew beer while my dad took in more money than I had ever seen in my life. Helping him count it at the end of the day was the most exciting experience I'd ever known. Here you go, Harold. You count the nickels and dimes while I add up the folding money. When I think of all those years I dug coal for a few measly bucks a day... 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60... Whoa, 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 that's no way to count. Take them two at a time. 20, 40, 60, 80, one dollar. Now, after you get good at that, take them four at a time. But always keep close track, son. This is our lifeblood. We got big money coming in. If you're going to make it big, you've got to learn to keep track of it. Happy days are here again, kid. 20, 40, 60. Money was my dad's god. By the time I went into high school, it was my god, too. The only one in the family in those days who knew any other god was my mother. While we worshiped money, she was praying for our souls. We didn't know it then, and we certainly didn't know that one of the best things you can do for anyone is to speak to God on their behalf. So my mom was loving my dad and me better than we understood. So I say all that to say, I'm proud of you. Thanks, Dad. Here. What's this? A gift. My boy is a high school graduate. Oh, thanks, Dad. You already got me a new suit of clothes. You don't need to title the property. What property? <laughs> this one. You are the proud owner of this tavern. What? Dad, I'm only 18. Right. And I'll be right here along with you to show you the ropes. Think of us as partners. Dad, I don't know what to say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Thank you. Does Mom know? Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, about that. Uh... Did she get upset? No, 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 no. <laughs> she got down on her knees. Lord, he's just a boy and doesn't know. Please, take him out of this, I pray. Take him out of this kind of life before it's too late. In Jesus' name, amen. It wasn't just the tavern keeping itself that troubled her. We expanded and added pool tables, dice tables, and some machines. These we own outright, and we banked the games and had a steady take from them. Also, I had developed an enterprise of my own. It involved a conventional young man's Model A Roadster of the day, complete with rumble seat, but with uh, a difference. Even my dad was impressed. I can't believe it, Harold. She looks like every other car on the road. That's the point. Of course, with the springs I got on the back, she'd ride pretty high if the tank was empty, but a couple hundred gallons of water takes care of that. That many gallons? That tank in the rumble holds 250. But Kentucky moonshine doesn't weigh quite as much as water. Oh, the profit on 250 gallons of tax-free booze will buy a lot of gasoline. Plenty more than I'll spend on this trip. Well, I better get going. I've got a pickup to make this afternoon. See you sometime tonight. Good luck, son. The rig looked so convincing that I didn't bother with back roads. I moved my cargo on the highways and usually made it back sometime during the night of the same day I started out. Sometimes after I parked the car in the shed and would walk around the house to the door, I passed my mother's room in here. Lord, he's headed for bad trouble and doesn't even know it. He won't listen to me. So I'm asking, take him away from all this, please, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not sure what connection my mother's prayers had with it, but when they drew the numbers out of the ball for the draft lottery in 1940, I was holding the first number drawn. In December of that same year, I beat the draft by volunteering for what was supposed to be a year of service. But after many months of training, Pearl Harbor put an end to that one-year business. My last post in the United States was Fort Benning. From there, we shipped out to become a part of the invasion of North Africa that began on November 8, 1942. We landed at Casablanca and began driving east. At the Kasserin Pass, my company lost all but three men, and I was one of them. I was given a battlefield commission, 
The company was rebuilt and re-equipped, and we later made the Sicily landing. We went from Italy back to Africa, then to England. By that time, I had made captain. On D plus one, we took our tanks ashore in the Normandy beachhead. We made it all with Patton's third army, including the bulge. What's your fuel situation, Captain? Not good, sir. We can make maybe 10 miles. That's plenty. The Germans aren't gonna let us move that far anyway. About a mile and a half will do fine right now. And you'd be lucky to do that. Later on when we need it, maybe we'll get some fuel trucks. Yes, sir. Wish I had my old Model A. How in the world is that gonna help us now? I mean, if I had the whiskey tank on that old booze buggy full of gasoline, why, General, we could fuel a battalion. You just think of those German artillery men as revenueers and see if you can move your company without their nailing you down. For some reason, General Oliver took a liking to me. He got me out of more trouble than I care to remember. He had the idea I was going to make the Army my career, but I disappointed him when I signed up for release from active duty in October of 1945. I went home to my tavern and right out of business when a local option vote turned my township dry. My mother's prayer answered again? Maybe, but I had no intention of getting out of a business that paid so well. I found another tavern in another city, bought it, moved my games and jukebox, and settled down to get rich. That lasted until the Korean War broke out in June of 1950. I was one of the first to be recalled, and when I reported for active duty, I found out why. Welcome home, Sullivan. General, sir, I didn't expect to see you. Yeah, and I didn't expect you to sign up to be a civilian behind my back. Yeah, sorry, sir. What are the odds that I get a sign here with you? Who do you think asked for your recall? The Korean War took me out of the tavern business for three years and 12 days. Maybe I should have stayed in the Army because it was as a civilian that I told the people who wanted to muscle in on my business to get lost. That's when they threw the bomb in my tavern. When I got out of the hospital, I sold a place and looked for another one to buy, this time in Calumet City. It wasn't long before I learned I wasn't gonna be safe from the efforts of others to muscle in. One day, a couple of guys came in and announced, the mob wants to talk to you. They left, and a few minutes later, two well-dressed, cigar-smoking strangers came in and ordered drinks. And here's your whiskey sour and your highball. Let me know if you need... Sit down, Sullivan. Well, I I've got... We want to talk business. All right. You got a nice little place here. Thanks. One thing we noticed, though, uh, you got your own machines. Why? Uh, I've owned those for a long time. Had them in the last two places I've operated. So naturally, when I moved, I brought them along. Naturally. But see, we control all those things. You control my machines? Starting today. Now, we don't want you to lose your investment. So here's what we'll do. We'll buy the machines from you. So they'll belong to us. What about the take? We want to be fair to you, Sullivan. So we'll make you a deal. 60-40. It doesn't sound so fair to me. Why should I sell when I own the machines now and keep all the profit? You served in the Army, right? Yeah. How'd you know that? Word gets around. You may remember an old saying in the Army that goes, they can't make you do what they tell you, but they can sure make you wish you had. That saying applies here. You understand, Sullivan? <sighs> yeah, I get it. Good. You made a smart decision, partner. That was the beginning of an association that went much farther than I wanted, a decision that would eventually cause me to run for my life. Folks, we'll get back to Harold's story in just a moment, but first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 71st year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. 
All you need to do is click on the live link if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's unshackledpodcast.org, and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, unshackled. We take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. And now, back to part one of the classic true story of Harold Sullivan. My deal over the machines in the tavern was the first step into a closer relationship with criminals. After that, each day brought another step, a closer relationship and greater danger. I don't get it. Are you not doing better than you were before? Yeah, I prospered, but I'm not sure it's really what I want. How could you say that? You sound ungrateful. No, I'm, I'm grateful. Look, just... look, 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 look. Since we've been partners, you've added a package store and a cocktail lounge to the properties you own. Which I'm glad for. And that package store is vital to our business partnership. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Good, good, because that's why I'm here. We got a shipment coming in that's going to arrive in the back of that package store next week. Shipment? Uh, what? What do you care? I'd just like to know what's... Drugs. It's a lot of drugs, okay? Now, the driver's going to have it here by midnight Tuesday, so don't be alarmed when you see that truck parked in your lot and then call the police. That would be very bad for you. Got it? Yeah, I got it. This stressed me out so much that I felt the need for what you might call a vacation. I heard of a manufacturing plant that needed a man with knowledge of heliarch, aluminum welding. I picked up some experience with that in the Army, so I applied for a factory job and got it. I asked my cousins to mind my businesses for me. On the new job, we had just installed a very large, multiple punch press that punctured slabs of metal almost four inches thick. After each stroke, it was my job to reach in and feel the newly punched holes for rough edges or burrs that might indicate some looseness in the die. How's she cutting, Sully? Feels okay so far. I'd get my head out from under if I were you. If that thing came down, it'd be quite a nutcracker. <laughs> yeah, thanks for mentioning it. Hey, here's a rough one. And maybe she needs a little adjustment. Uh, look out! <laughs> yeah! Mr. Sullivan, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Doc. How are you feeling? I felt better. Well, surgery does take it out of you. Yeah. Were you able to fix my arm? Mr. Sullivan, there was, uh, well, just too much damage. Are you saying I won't be able to use it? I'm saying you don't have it. I had to remove your arm, Mr. Sullivan. I'm sorry. Oh, no. I retained the lawyer to bring suit for the injury and went back to running my lounge in Hammond, Indiana. As time went on, I began to notice that the same people who had made me their reluctant partner by buying my equipment were using my establishment as a meeting place. That meant I was acquiring information that I knew I was better off without. Some of the information was given to me deliberately. I was being involved with some purpose in mind. I figured that out when I was taken to a place in Chicago to watch how pressure for collection was applied to a man who'd gotten into debt with the wrong people. They made me watch as he was hung by his thumbs on barbed wire and then was whipped with another length of that same wire. Let me down. Let me down. <laughs> let me down. Let me down. <laughs> First, get this straight. You make your payment next week, all of it, and right on time. You don't like what's happening to you now? How are you going to like it when it happens to your wife no. and your daughter? Oh, 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 no! Oh. I witnessed utter evil that night. Not long after that, I was invited to go by a chauffeur-driven car to a meeting in Chicago. The location was a luxuriously furnished apartment. At a conference table in the den sat five men. They wasted no time. I hear you watched a little collection work the other day. That's right. It's a very profitable business. We control it. 
Right now, we need the right man to handle it for us in your area. Right man? Pays 800 a week and fringe benefits. A Cadillac, an apartment, an unlimited clothing account. So? You're... You're talking about me? Of course. That's... Well, I suppose it has some attractions, I'll admit. Yeah, there are other attractions. Show me the bedroom. Yeah, come with me. I'll show you more of the fringe benefits. I'm going to show you a heroin addict. You'll notice she's cuffed to the bed. Cuffed to the... That's because we haven't allowed her to have any stuff for two days. Mister? Please, mister. I think I'm going to die if I don't get a fix. I'll do anything for it. Anything at all. No. No, 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 no. Don't go away. Please. We just bought her from Texas. That's going to be in your department, too. That girl was probably no more than 17 or 18 years old, but she was covered with needle marks. It almost destroyed her. Whatever effect those men expected me to have from seeing her, greed, lust, or simply cruelty, they were wrong. I was suddenly sick to the point of actual nausea, and I knew I had to get out of that place. As I walked back to the conference table in the den, I hardly noticed the man beside me. I was remembering my mother and her prayers. Lord, take my son out of this terrible life he's leading. Please, take him out. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Sullivan, now you know all the fringe benefits. What's your decision? Can you wait a little? I'll let you know. I see. You won't have another chance. Take them back where you got them. I knew my hesitation to take their offer put me in serious trouble. But on the long ride back to my own place, my mind hardly touched on those men at all. I was asking myself how I'd reached that point where anyone would even think that I was the right man for the proposal they had made me. I saw then where it had all led starting with a kid standing on a box and drawing beer for coal miners. I was sick of myself and sick of my way of life. Before the end of the ride, I had made up my mind that I was going to sell out lock, stock, and barrel. I would try to make a new beginning, which I did within just a matter of days, but it wasn't the new beginning I wanted. It was the beginning of a nightmare of fear as I ran for my life. As much as you'd like to believe it, you don't have the spiritual upper body strength to pull yourself out of the hole you're in. If you feel like you're in too deep, maybe in a, an adulterous relationship, a drug addiction, even in that white lie that's snowballed out of control, you are never too far gone to stop, repent, and reach for Jesus' hand. Acts 3.19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When you repent and believe in Jesus, He doesn't just pull you out of the hole, He fills it in. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions, please, and we'll answer them here. Uh, it can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312-281-1264. We'd love to hear from you. But in the meantime, here is a fact about Unshackled. Did you know that we have almost every episode of Unshackled archived? We have almost 3,673 of them since we started in 1950, including the physical copy of our first episode. We want these stories to live on to keep helping transform lives. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast, and don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. 
We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. Okay, here's the prize for our upcoming sweepstakes contest, a beautiful wooden scripture plaque. And I believe the scripture on this uh, particular plaque is Psalm 4610, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the earth. Folks, this is a gorgeous plaque, especially if you're looking for uh, daily inspiration from Scripture. You will love this authentic and uh, very unique wooden plaque. The plaque has been sawn from a tree branch or a log uh, and cut in such a way to retain as much of the bark around the perimeter as possible. I didn't actually witness that happening, but I can assure you it did. It's been handcrafted around the natural character and the beauty of the wood that God created. So all you have to do to enter our unshackled audio drama podcast sweepstakes drawing, (gasps) that's a mouthful, is call 312-281-1264 or email podcast at unshackled.org and give us your name, phone number, and email, your name, phone number, and email. The winner of this sweepstakes uh, drawing for this beautiful scripture plaque will be announced on July 26th, but the deadline for entry is July 21st. The deadline for entry, July 21st. And next time... Sit down, Sullivan. Well, I've got... We want to talk business. We want to be fair to you, Sullivan, so we'll make you a deal. Harold Sullivan made the fatal mistake of going into business with the mob. It's a very profitable business. Right now, we need the right man to handle it for us in your area. Right man? Pays 800 a week and fringe benefits. Show him the bedroom. Mister... Please, mister. No, 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 no. Don't go away. Please. We just bought her. That's going to be in your department, too. Can you wait a little? Uh, I'll let you know. You won't have another chance. When he drew the line with them at sex trafficking, he sparked their ire and went on the run to save his life. You're right about getting out of the country. Even then, they'll try and follow you. That's what I was thinking. Don't miss the second chapter of this exciting classic true story on the next Unshackled. Heard in part one of the classic true story of Harold Sullivan were Stephen Spencer, Mara Kate Burns, Dave Kappas, Michael Walner, Gary Brichetto, and Bill Ronsky. Original music and audio engineer Don Badorf. Sound effects Michael Walner. Recording engineer David Pierczynski. Script Jack O'Dell and Timothy Gregory. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ.